Our reading for this morning is Haja writes a letter to Sarah as a cathartic exercise suggested by her therapist, by Moja Kaf. Dear Sarah, life made us enemies, but it doesn't have to be that way. What if we both ditched the old man? He could have visitation rights with the boys, alternate weekends, holidays, especially the Feast of the Sacrifice. He took that day away, forgetting it was about me in the desert, watching my baby dehydrate near to death. Anyhow, you and I, we'd set up house, raise the kids, start a catering business. Maybe you have brains, so do I. We could travel. There are places to see besides Ur in this nowheresville desert with its tribes of hooligans. No. Your lips thin when you disapprove, like the mother I almost remember from before I wound up in your house. I was barely more than a girl. You used to laugh then, in those days. You could stand to look at me. We even hugged sometimes. Oh, Sarah, you need years of therapy. Can't you admit that what he did was wrong? Be angry at him just for one second. You don't have to be angry forever, just long enough to know the world won't fall apart. Long enough to pity him, yourself, me. Laugh, Sarah, laugh. Imagine God. The possibility. Sincerely, love, Haja. Will you sit with me? Will you sit with me? Just for a little while. I know there's a world we're fighting for. Comrade, I am hurting. Comrade, I am hurting. Just for a little while, I know there's a world we're fighting for. I'm not running away. No, I'm not giving up hope. But I am feeling tired Just for a little while I know there's a world we're fighting for Comrade, hold my hand Comrade, remind me Just for a little while I know there's a world we're fighting for Just for a little while I know there's a world we're fighting for I recently heard someone call the year 2020 the Great Reckoning. The combination of multiple catastrophes coming to a head our humanity-driven climate crisis, the COVID-19 pandemic exacerbated by inequitable healthcare systems, and the centuries-long violent policing of black and brown lives in this country has all brought to our mainstream attention just how much as a society and world we desperately need to acknowledge and address. For some of us, these realities have long been a part of our awareness, if not our own lived experience. And now, for all of us, these realities are undeniable and at the forefront of our lives and our futures. And as part of this great reckoning, our leaders, our institutions, our societies are being once again called upon to acknowledge essential and challenging truths about our past and the impact they have on our lives in the present and future. These last seven months as a society, we have received an abundance of invitations, and frankly, with more patience than perhaps we have earned, to re-examine the stories we tell of our history and the narratives we glorify and memorialize. 
we as a society have received an abundance of invitations to expand our collective awareness and listen and center the experiences, histories, and stories that have been denied through erasure, sugarcoating, and genocide. Those are harsh words, and they are true ones. There are sides to our collective story, the story of our world, our country, our humanity, that have for too long gone unacknowledged. So in this great reckoning, we are being invited to do the hard, holy work of learning those new stories so that we can all begin to undo and heal from the harm our old ones continue to cause. And so to do this learning and healing work, this holy, sacred soul work, we as a society and as a tradition must commit ourselves to listening to and amplifying those stories and experiences that haven't been historically centered or even told. We must come to an understanding that the majority narrative that many of us grew up in, it doesn't tell the whole story. There are more perspectives out there that complexify and expand our collective story. And when we open ourselves up to those truths that have been sometimes whispered and more recently screaming to be heard, we open ourselves up not to just an understanding of the suffering and harm and tragedy they bring to our collective story, but we also open ourselves up to the wisdom, the faith, the perseverance, the creativity, and the possibility that they weave into our shared narrative. We expand our collective story, not only in our telling of our past, but in our imagining of our future. And so today, two days after Eid al-Adha, a holiday that is celebrated by many followers of the Islamic traditions, I'd like to invite you into a story that is not often centered or told. Eid al-Adha is commonly translated as the Feast of the Sacrifice. It is a holiday that is often described as commemorating the sacrifice that Abraham and his son were willing to make to God. In the Islamic traditions, it is commonly shared that Abraham, or Ibrahim, was told by God that he must sacrifice his son Ishmael to demonstrate the obedience of his faith. When Ibrahim tells his son Ishmael of this command, Ishmael is described as consenting to the sacrifice of his own life to God. Now, while this first part of the story varies to an extent from the Jewish and Christian versions some might be more familiar with, the ending is largely the same. An angel intervenes before Ishmael is killed and says that both his and Ibrahim's faith has been proven strong, and they instead end up sacrificing a ram or a goat. Now, I grew up hearing this story as an example of how obedient one must be in order to be a good person or a good Muslim. After the Prophet Muhammad, Ibrahim and Ishmael were the pinnacles of what it meant to have real faith. But as I'm sure is the case with many of you hearing that story in this moment, that example never really sat right with me. That narrative had, that I had been raised in, it felt at best incomplete and at worst harmful and dangerous. And I'm sure it would surprise none of you that that was in fact my experience of it growing up. And that's partly because there is at least one person missing in that story, one experience and perspective that isn't centered but should be told if there is to be any learning and healing to be done. And that perspective is that of Ishmael's mother and one of Ibrahim's wives, Hagar, or Hajar. In many Judeo-Christian contexts, Hajar, or Hagar, is more often than not described through the lens of her relationship with Abraham and the ways in which she and her child were presented as tests of his faith. But she is much, 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 much more than that a reality that black womanist theologians and the Christian traditions like Dolores Williams have been lifting up for several generations, and what Muslima feminist and liberation theologians have also described in their engagement with the Islamic traditions. 
Now in Judeo-Christian tellings of the story, Hagar is described as being anywhere from a slave to a second wife to a surrogate mother when Sarah is not able to conceive a child with Ibrahim. In the Islamic traditions, the same range of possibilities exists with more emphasis placed on the second wife story. Now as the majority narrative around Hajar's story in the Islamic traditions go, she was married to Ibrahim, as was Sarah. And Hajar was the first to have a child in that relationship. And then, when her son was still an infant, something else happened that would change the course of Hajar's life. According to majority narratives in the Islamic traditions, Ibrahim was told by God to bring Hajar and her infant child Ishmael to a barren spot in the desert and leave them there with just some water and some dates. The story, as I was taught as a child, was that when Ibrahim turned to leave them, Hajar asked him repeatedly, why are you leaving us here? Why are you leaving us here? And every single time, Ibrahim did not respond. It was only when she asked him, did God tell you to bring us here? Did Ibrahim answer, yes. And so Hajar then responded, then go, God will protect us. So eventually the little bit of water and dates that Hajar had with her ran out and soon she could no longer provide milk for her son. I cannot imagine what she felt like in that moment. Thirsty, hungry, and with her hungry child wailing in her arms. Nothing and no one around her but arid desert. But what happens next in her story does tell me a little bit about what she might have been thinking when she said, then go, God will protect us. See, Hajar begins to search for water in that desert. She places her child on the ground and begins running back and forth, searching between two large hills in the area. She searches for any sign of water or nourishment that would help her and her baby survive. And eventually, an angel appears and shows her a spring of water flowing right next to her infant son's heel. And her story doesn't stop there. What Hajar does in this moment of discovery demonstrates her imagination, her creativity, and her foresight. She not only drinks from that spring of water, she shares it with her child, and she creates a well around that spring. She knew what she was doing. She was preserving its presence and maintaining access to its life force, and not just for her. Hajar lived in a nomadic world, and so she knew that when travelers would eventually pass through her little spot of the desert, she would be able to trade water for food and supplies to survive in that previously desolate spot. And that's exactly what happened in her story. Hajar and her son not only survived because of her perseverance and creativity, they thrived. Travelers were not only passing through this place, some of them stayed, and an entire town, an entire city grew around them. A city that began when one woman, one single mother, acted, created, and imagined in spite of the odds she was facing, motivated by her firmly held faith in the promise of God's protection. And the name of that city, as some of you might have figured out, is Mecca. Now, none of us were there when Ibrahim left Hajar and her son in the desert. But what I like to imagine is that Hajar embodied an attitude of resistance and anger that was captured by the poem we heard by Moja Kaf today. The moment she found out that Ibrahim believed that God told him to leave a woman and her child in the desert, I love imagining her reaction to be something along the lines of, boy, bye, I've got something better for me. I've got something better looking out for me. I imagine that in the middle of the fear and confusion of being left to potentially die in the desert, that Hajar is unapologetic in her anger at how Ibrahim has treated her and says, then go, go. There is a greater promise of protection that I know I am worthy of. 
And Hajar didn't just wait for that promise of protection. Her belief that God would protect her and her infant son didn't just cause Hajar to become a passive victim waiting to be saved in those circumstances. Instead, her belief in that promise moves her to do the opposite. She acts, rooted in her anger, rooted in her faith and her fear and her creativity, knowing that to experience that promise, she had a part to play in helping to create it. Her faith doesn't tell her to just wait. Her faith tells her to act. Her faith tells her that she herself is integral to the promise of protection. And in her decision to claim her part, her power, she not only finds water to survive a day or two, she uses that water to create tools and strategies she needs to thrive in the desert. She innovates. She provides for herself and her son. She makes connections. She builds a mutually supportive community, an early mutual aid network out in the desert that not only allows herself but many more to eventually call this spot home. When Hajar told Abraham to go because God would protect her and her child, she wasn't a woman submitting to abandonment. She was a woman who chose to make a promise real by living into her greatest capacities for resilience, creativity, imagination, and hope. And I like to believe that this part of Hajar's story adds to our collective story about our potential as people and as communities. She is a woman in a patriarchal society left stranded in the desert with her child, a promise, and her faith. And her creative power. A power that resides within each and every one of us. To imagine, persevere, and create, not just to survive, but to thrive. Those gifts are one we can demonstrate or surprise ourselves with every day, whether it's by making a 3D printed name tag or by managing a full-time job while suddenly tasked with homeschooling your beloved children. Inherent to our affirmation of an individual's free and responsible truth, search for truth and meaning is a promise of our innate, creative, resilient potential. I noticed this morning here on your sanctuary wall the kingdom of God is within you. That is a promise that we all hold. And accessing that promise, accessing that potential, strengthening and growing it, that's an act that needs to happen in community. Has her story, her creativity, her ingenuity, and her power was not simply shown by her running between two hills and creating a makeshift well, the promise she believed came into full fruition when she collaborated with others to make it so. She didn't just go from surviving to thriving on her own. She did so in community with others who helped make that promise of protection come true for all of them. That, to me, sounds like the universal salvation that our universal's predecessors inspire in us where everyone experiences the promise of an abundant love created here on earth with our combined hands and hearts. So what on earth does this have to do with the Eid al-Adha story? Knowing Hajar's story, opening ourselves up to her perspective complexifies things. And yeah, maybe the story of this attempted sacrifice as it is isn't all that great. And what if we just own that? Parts of that story really suck. What if we used our reading from Moja Kof this morning as an invitation to imagine Hezer's perspective on the whole thing? See, in her poem, Kof then imagines Hezer going one more step in creating creativity and resilience. She imagines the promise that Hajar imagined, a better world not just for her, but for Sarah and their two boys. In this imagining of Hajar's perspective, we not only see her believing in the promise of a better world, but believing in a path to it, and inviting Sarah, despite their broken relationship, to join her. Out of pain, out of anger, she still knew it doesn't have to be that way. Hajar writes this letter to Sarah about their circumstances, naming both truths that challenge and possibilities that invite. What if we both ditch the old man? 
We could travel. Imagine God. Imagine the possibility. Imagine us making God's promise come true. That's the part of the story that almost always doesn't get told. And that's the story we need. The imagination, the possibility. That's the promise of water in the desert that we will miss if we hold too tightly to an old story. But if we let something new in, if we open ourselves up to searching for something, maybe we will find that water that has been calling to us all along. In this year's Great Reckoning, Hajar is writing that letter to all of us who have felt at least some inkling that something is wrong, but unsure of what we can do about it. We are being invited to join her in that desert, to partner with her in that perseverant search for water, its preservation, its cultivation into the sacred promise of something more. Like Hajar to Sarah, we all hold an invitation to collectively imagine. As we are being called to challenge and grow beyond what we know, we are also being invited to remember the creativity and resilience within each and every one of us, the kingdom of God within each and every one of us, and to know that it doesn't have to be like this. We are being invited to play our part in manifesting that promise of the divine, sacred, moral arc of the universe that bends towards justice with love. And what do those invitations look like? They look like those calls to recognize the environmental degradation and the ways in which our complacency has left our children and grandchildren to a devastating future. They are calls to actively obstruct pipeline construction, to divest from funds heavily rooted in oil production, to aggressively move towards renewable sources of energy and prioritize ecological preservation. These are all calls for us to collectively nurture that sacred promise to create something new. What do those invitations look like? They look like calls to defund the police, to abolish immigration and customs enforcement on Saturday, to abolish prisons and end slavery preserving systems of policing and incarceration that we have in this country. They are calls to invest in practices and systems of restorative justice, to support community health and education services that care for the whole person. These are all calls for us to collectively nurture that sacred promise to create something new. These invitations, they look like calls for universal health care, income and housing, calls for an end to predatory capitalistic economic practices that rely on keeping a subset of our human siblings in abhorrent, virtually inescapable poverty. These are all calls for us to collectively nurture a sacred promise to create something new. Hajar didn't know what that promise of protection would look like when Ibrahim walked away. She didn't know where the water would be. But she knew she would be protected and took action in that belief that something would be created out of her choices to believe. And my faith, my faith moves me to do the same. My faith is why I am in this role as the executive director of your Unitarian Universalist Justice Ministry of California. It's why, as an organization, we are committed to supporting Unitarian Universalists working to make our faith's promise real. It's why we, as an organization, put our support behind the people and communities whose stories deepen our understanding of the past and expand our imagination of the future. It's why I'm here live streaming to you in the middle of our great reckoning today. Because I believe in our faith's promise. I believe in us. We are in a uniquely challenging, isolating, and frightening desert. And we are facing one of the most creative moments of our time. If we are willing to open ourselves up to the truths they hold, and the possibilities 
they invite. We will feel our faith's promise of water in this desert if we commit to creating it.